Confederates had been here. This is laid out when before Tennessee left the Union. So it's laid out by personnel in the Tennessee Army. This Tennessee does not officially secede from the Union until the sixth day of, ten, of, uh, of June. Uh, and uh, they're, this, they made a good selection here. Uh, they're going to see this reach of the river here. Uh, it's going to cover the railroad, which uh, passes to the south of us through Cumberland City and on to Danville. And they're going to, this will be a good position. The only bad thing about this position, this is going to dictate where the position at Fort Henry is going to be. And they're going to arm it, and it's going to be uh, looked over now. Uh, a engineer, uh, Major Dixon, is the big, most important man. They detail two companies of men from the, uh, from, uh, from uh, the uh, Bailey's Brigade, Beaumont's company and Bidwell's company. They're going to make them into artillerists. They have listed to fight in the infantry. They're only going to have one, uh, uh, one organized battery here, and that will be Reuben Ross's. So when they, when they, uh, they complete the position, we're going sorry, to see sorry, sorry, sorry. why they locate it here. You've got that reach of river. You go down there about a mile and a half, and you've got that sharp bend. So they're going to position the uh, they're going to position the the uh, the uh, lower battery. This is uh, uh, down. It's the closest to the enemy. They're going to have the upper battery, which is only going to have one effective gun in it, and that will be the rifled tw uh, 24 pounder that converts it to a rifle, firing a uh, an explosive shell much heavier. The two smaller guns are 32 carronades. They're trained when in the Navy it was close action with the enemy. These are 32 pounders. They are, uh, they uh, fire a 32 round shell and were very popular in the Navy when you were, when you were coming alongside broadside to another enemy and a ship broadside. You can give a lot of uh, pain and suffering uh, with these, but they do not have a good range, as you can see. That's uh, right. So um, when they, uh, they're going to have trouble getting the artillery here. Not just about like E.J. had of rearming the battery, uh, but uh, because they're going to, uh, they're, the, the, the biggest gun is here, uh, the rifle battery, and the ten uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the big Colum Columbia will not arrive here till after the fighting has started at Fort Henry. So they so they're going to arm the battery and they're going to have very little practice on them uh, because the two most effective guns are going to arrive very late. They've been. Some they've been laying in a de de uh, de depot up in Nashville, and they don't get them down here until the uh, enemy appears before Fort Henry. So when they position them, they're going to position the ten the uh, ten inch Columbia is going to be the gun on the extreme left. Now, as Tim and I have found, you have to figure out. You've got to uh, come here and read through all the reports to learn that that 10-inch Columbia is on the extreme left. I always saw, I saw it until I read through all the damn reports that it was on the extreme right of this. Now, these other four, six, eight positions are armed with 32-pounder smoothbores. That means uh, if the enemy gets very close to them, you can do a hell of a lot of damage with them. They're going to arm, these are going to be armed, half of them are going to be armed with Beaumont's company, infantrymen, 
and uh, Bidwell's company who are infantrymen, and Dixon is in charge of the battery as the engineer. So they're going to position them as you see them. Now, at that time at the attack, each one of these positions is occupied by a 32-pounder. Now, they're, they're going to knock out one of the 32-pounders during the engagement on the uh, 14th. When Dixon is in a bad position, he's picking over picking something up, and a, and a, and a bolt, uh, and a, a projectile hits the 32-pounder. He's standing next to it. It fractures the uh, uh, bolt, and the nut of it hits him in the skull, and he doesn't have to worry about any pain or suffering because he's killed instantly. So that means he's going to be eliminated. So, so, that, so that's how they're going to be in position. Ross is going to be up there. Ross's men are in the artillery. So they're going to have these guns in position. I don't know why. We'll have to ask the superintendent because you really should have all you should have uh, you should have uh, rather than you should have eight 32 pounders in position here and have one of them dis market is disabled. Uh, so he is, uh, I don't know why he's messing around with those 32 pounders. You better be careful or he may have a son of a bitch like me find out maybe some other park needs him. <laughs> <laughs> but I have no authority in the park as a service anymore. So uh, of co course, uh, now we're going, before we go to the attack, we're going to turn this back over uh, to Tim uh, so he can give you why the the big, what's going to be happening here, and I will go into some more detail when the fighting starts. But when t it works in there for Tim now to talk about the Union and the Confederates and the Union investment here, because that's going to give when they're going to be getting manned. Turning over to my colleague and good friend. All right. Um, <clears throat> Just a word of explanation. This is a, a great example oh, of how the military. To mention, I forgot to mention the magazine. So that is. The magazine. We, we can walk down and see the magazine. Um, the Confederates will dig bomb proofs in magazines to uh, to uh, protect their their uh, ammunition and so on. And you can actually see the entrance of it right down here. We can walk down in, in just a little bit. Uh, the way the uh, Army does things, you know, only the Army would name this. The lower battery. So you're we're higher. Trouble with that. We're, we're higher. The upper battery. Did you see the upper battery? That's lower. The lower battery is upper. But what they're doing, of course, this is the lower battery because it's lower down the river, and that's the <laughs> upper battery because it's upper uh, the river. So it's not up and down. It's it's back and forth. Only the army, right? Um, I guess there's no real good way to to do this. They should have named it Battery Bars and Battery Pratt, shouldn't they? That would have been a good... Uh, They're responsible for it. <laughs> uh, to kind of set up what's going on here in terms of the fighting uh, that, that he will describe in just a minute, and, uh, and the gunboats are, are coming, of course, uh, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind here. Uh, number one, the Federal Infantry has arrived by this point and begun to invest the outer works out there. But that's not really worrying the Confederate High Command. John Floyd by this point, um, Gideon Pilla, Simon Bolivar Buckner, they're not really worried about that. What they're worried about is what's coming down that river right there. And they know it's coming because they can see the smoke around the bend, the smoke coming out of the stacks. So they know their transports down there. They know there's uh, at least gunboats, um, not sure how many. Uh, what they're seeing, of course, is the Carondelet, which uh, there, there are numerous uh, explanations of, of what uh, this looked like and, and who's describing this and so on. And the Confederates here talk about that thing poking its nose around that bend down there. And uh, they, one of them says it looks like a, a, a train engine. It's got the cattle catcher on the front, you know, the cow catcher and the, the smokestacks and, and so on. And it pokes its, its nose around there as early as the 13th because Grant had told Commander Walk, Henry Walk, to throw a few shells in the area to let me know you are there. 
and of course Grant is here by that time and they uh, they make contact. So the Carondelet comes around and fires into Fort Donaldson a, a little while, no major attack or anything like that. In fact, Colonel or uh, Commander Walk describes how Fort Donaldson looked at the time as well. Not only the Confederates describing him, uh, but he's describing uh, the the Fort Donaldson. And he uh, actually described one of my favorite quotes. He says, it looks like all the rock-hewn tombs of old Jerusalem yeah. uh, in in the face of this this, uh, this ridge Walk here. I think in his career had been in the Holy Land. Walk had been in the Holy Land, and, and that was, was his description of it. Uh, so, a actually, that was on the 12th. I'm getting my days mixed up. He arrives on the 12th, uh, same day Grant arrives. On the 13th, he makes another pass in here. Uh, to to throw some more shells. Grant asked him to aid our land operations. Uh, Grant is going to be, um, or not Grant, but McLernan and C.F. Smith are going to be assaulting the Confederate lines on the 13th, and Grant says that might help a little bit if you'll throw some shells in there. Not a major attack or anything like that. And then on the 14th, of course, uh, once the rest of the flotilla and, and uh, Flag Officer Foote has arrived, uh, they will make the, the major attack. But what is interesting to me is that throughout this uh, uh, process on the 12th and on the 13th and even early on the 14th as those gunboats come around and the Confederates open fire what are the Confederates thinking is going on well they're attacking and we drove them back we, we drove those Yankees back three or four times right so the morale is building in the Confederate forces here while Grant is thinking okay they can help us out just a little bit actually what he's doing is hurting his his cause just a little bit because you're giving these Confederate gunners who are green as grass a little bit of experience they're testing ranges they're able to fire and and you're building up uh, morale a little bit even with that though you've still got the other major concept going on here and that is the dreaded fear of those gunboats because what had just happened at Fort Henry they had blown that fort to pieces you don't even need the army so they're not worried about the army out there they're worried the Confederates are worried about the Navy as he described yesterday uh, Forrest turns to the preacher and says pray for you know God's the only one that can help us at, at this point uh, we don't have any chance. They are, are majorly fearful of those gunboats, and they think this is going to be Fort Henry all over. And, of course, we're going to see uh, that there's a little bit of, uh, of difference on that. Actually, what they don't fear is what's going to rise up to bite them, and what they do fear is going to turn out to be not a, not a major impact at all. All right. The uh, convoy is coming up the river with reinforcements, which Buell earlier, in accordance to directions from Alec, had taken from Buell's army and had sent to Paducah. So they're going to be carrying uh, uh, about uh, 10,000 reinforcements for Grant uh, that they pick up at Paducah on the transports. Now, it is a uh, it's going to turn very, very cold on the night of the 13th and the 14th. That is when the temperature, at least on some of the ships, they're going to say the temperature drops to 20 degrees. Now, undoubtedly, they're speaking 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't think they're drinking 20 degrees below zero. So it's very cold. The uh, foot is uh, foot is fairly confident, but he's also nervous. He knows the uh, of the damage that Essex had taken at the Battle of Fort Henry. So he is, and he knows the ar the pilot houses, which are not armored, had been uh, had been uh, a weak spot on them. So he's going to do something that's not going to be very good. He's going to use, the Navy has always used the same type of sea bag, whether it is in World War II or in the War of 1812. It is a what white bag. Uh, when it come when it's full, when, they, when a hammock is in it, would hit me about the belt. And they stack these hammocks around the pilot houses. 
the, the vessels are painted black. So it's going to be like giving the Confederates something to shoot at, the pilot house. And they're going to concentrate on hitting the pilot house, particularly when the gunboats try to close up once they have crossed the river barricade. Now, 800 yards below us, probably, uh, maybe, uh, let, let's say that building we can see standing there with the uh, light tower by it, uh, and you can see a buoy, a green buoy, uh, green on one side, red on the other. That's about where the obstruction is. They've sunk, they've sunk in obstructions in the river at that point. That means once you pass, and you have also, they're not idiots. They have put targets on the trees. They can take a white piece of tin, nail it to a tree, and they know the range. So there are considerable preparations uh, to try to uh, overcome the difficulties they had had at Fort, uh, at Fort Henry. The big weakness on the vessel is the cables that come from the pilot wheel. The pilot house is very vulnerable because when you turn the wheel, cable, uh, one, inch, one inch cable drops down inside the casemate. But it comes out of the casement at the stern of the vessel. And you have about 15 feet of the stern of the vessel that is not armored. And if a shell explodes over it, and, that, uh, and, that, and, the, cable, and the cable that controls the, the uh, tiller on the, pi on the rudders uh, can be cut. And they're going to have that trouble on it. He has not corrected that at all. And of course, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, and the, there's, it's well covered by the press. Uh, the press is uh, here, they're very high, uh, they are very confident, and if you can see, they have even a guy like Forrest, who is fearless, uh, wanting God's help uh, for the Confederates. Uh, you can see that even a, a, a gung-ho fighter like he is, is very worried. Now, we are going to know when they're coming because you can see that sharp bend down the river. You can see, of course, the, the co columns of smoke rising from the, from the funnels, the chimneys, before they even round that bend. So the Confederates have time to go to general quarters and be ready for them. Uh, might be interesting when we go down here and put, now the one thing Pratt is not responsible for, he inherits this. He inherits the reconstruction of the magazine. So the magazine is there. Uh, he, uh, and uh, the shaping of the batteries are part of uh, Pratt's job. And they're going to, uh, of course, they're going to come up river, and accordingly, on the previous day, uh, Dixon had been uh, uh, eliminated, and they're going to come up the river, and they're going to do the same thing as they did at Fort uh, at Fort Donaldson. Now, the flag vessel is on the extreme right. Next, and they're going to take a strike. Now, this river is not as wide as the Tennessee River. So you're going to uh, uh, position him. Uh, uh, of course, Foote can't be on his lucky vessel. He can't be on Cincinnati. And Cincinnati took so much damage, he has now moved his flag uh, to the St. Louis. On the St. Louis is a new guy. He hadn't been at Fort Henry. This is Louisville, commanded by uh, Commander Dove. Now, Grant, and now, Port, now Wallace is going to have a rather sharp exchange with Dove at the Surrender House later on. And on the Dove's left is going to be a new boat we haven't heard of, Egbert Thompson in command of Pittsburgh. 
Now, the Confederates came very close to sinking the Pittsburgh. That would have been horrible. And then, of course, Walk is in the most dangerous place. He's on the extreme left, on Colonel A. And uh, he will be the last one to retire as they close on, on the fort. Now, as they're going to come forward, they're designed to fire bows on. That's where the three heaviest guns on each of the uh, Eads City Series Iron Guides. Their uh, port and starboard batteries, their stern guns, they, they're not helping. They're going to be fighting bows on. That's how they're designed to fire. And uh, I think uh, we'll go down and walk along the battery there and get another view for your pictures and uh, see where the magazine is. 